in on chemistry. Mikhail Bridges was had for five draft picks, okay? We'll get to that shortly, but I've got to start with, I absolutely love what my Knicks are doing. They're, they're now the Villanova Knicks, because they got four guys in Brunson, DiVincenzo, Bridges, and Hart, who won a title in Villanova back uh, maybe like seven, eight years ago, and now they're reunited, and it feels so good in New York. I know a lot of people are poo-pooing the deal. The Knicks overpaid. We'll get to that shortly. But I need to start with something because it feels like for months on this show, we've been talking about how the Knicks have their, they've got the draft assets. They can go for a number one. They can go grab Carl Anthony Towns. The Knicks can go after Joel Embiid. Maybe we can pluck him from Philadelphia. What about Paul George? All we've been hearing is, hey, the Knicks need either a number one star or a number two to go with Jalen Brunson, who maybe isn't a one, maybe he's a 1B and all that nonsense. Folks, the Knicks are disrupting or attempting to disrupt the NBA hierarchy of you need superstars to win in the league. You need one of the five or 10 best players. You need the Shaq and Kobe. You need the Jokic, the, uh, the multiple time MVP. You need that superstar. And the Knicks are saying, not so fast, my friends. There's another way to skin a cat, as they like to say. We've seen this throughout the economy at large, outside of sports, right? We saw the internet disrupt traditional media. We then saw social media disrupt the internet and websites. And now we're starting to see AI taking over, disrupting Google and their dominance in search. And I mean, listen, in the uh, vehicle market, we're seeing EVs disrupting automobiles in the NFL Look what the 49ers are doing. Hey, we know everybody needs a quarterback, and then you build around the QB. Why don't we try something different? Why don't we try building the infrastructure and then plugging in a Jimmy Garoppolo, a Brock Purdy, and let's see how that works out, and they've been to a couple Super Bowls. The Knicks are doing the same thing. We don't need no superstar. We can build with chemistry, and what they've got with this team in New York right now, folks, their odds shifted after the Bridges trade they have now the third best odds to win the title after Boston and Denver. This is a massive shock to the system. And uh, uh, listen, you don't need to go far to see what Minnesota did when they said, we're going to trade a bunch of picks for Rudy Gobert. They were openly mocked. Didn't go great the first year. What happened in year two? They were built to take down Denver, and that's just what they did in the postseason. Gobert matched up with Jokic. It went swimmingly Minnesota to the conference finals. If you look at this New York roster, one through nine, folks, they match up great with the Boston Celtics. You now have, between Bridges and Ananobi, the two best defensive wings in the league to match up with Brown and Tatum. Then you've got your point guard in Brunson. And oh, by the way, giving up five draft picks. I saw a headline on a website. Knicks fleeced for Mikhail Bridges. No time all-star Mikhail Bridges for five first-round picks. Are you crazy? doesn't really matter. The Knicks are built now to battle Boston. New York is clearly the second best team in the East. They're, that's undeniable. I don't care what Joel Embiid does. Joel Embiid adds Paul George to Tyrese Maxey and the kid McCain, who I like in the draft. It's not going to matter. The Knicks are better one through nine. They kept Julius Randle. Ah, oh, Jason, Julius Randle. Come on, he's trade bait. Maybe. He's also a two-time All-NBA player in the last three years. Julius Randle's a very solid player to go with Brunson and Ananobi and Bridges. And oh, by the way, you got glue guy Josh Hart. You got Dante DiVincenzo. Folks, I know people are saying they're going to lose Hartenstein, the center who was invaluable. But I want to remind everybody what they did last night, the Knicks in the draft. With 25, they got a, a draft and stash European player. And then at 26, they traded it. So now they're able to save. I think I saw the number was $3 million. If that is able to keep Hartenstein, that's another win for the Knicks. And I'm telling you right now, I remember those 90s Knicks teams. Remember, I was not a Jordan fan. I was a Knicks fan, born in New York. I love New York. This team is ready to make a run like the Patrick Ewing did, team did in the 90s. I love the New York Knicks and what they've done this draft week. Now let's pivot to my also, my other team, the Los Angeles Lakers. Jay, how are you a Knicks-Lakers fan? Well, I was born in New York. And then the first couple games I went to as a young guy were Knicks-Lakers, as fortune would have it. And I fell in love with Magic Johnson and the Showtime Lakers. And a lot has been written about the Lakers in the last 24 hours. They get one of the steals in the draft in Dalton Connect. Now, Colin likes to make fun of me 
okay, for watching and gambling on college basketball uh, all season. He's like, oh, Jay, what are you doing? I, I love me some college hoops. And I'll tell you right now, Dalton Connect was one of the best stories in college basketball last season. This is a guy who went to junior college. He grew three inches from like a 6'3 point guard to a 6'6 wing. He went to the big sky. He went from second team all big sky to first team all American at Tennessee. He is an assassin when it comes to shooting. I think he scored 38 against Purdue in the NCAA tournament, which they lost. I think he gave UNC 40, dropped like 39 on Kentucky. This guy is a sniper. He kind of sort of might remind the Lakers' new coach, J.J. Redick, of uh, himself. Here's Rob Palinka of the Lakers talking about drafting Dalton Connect. We would have never imagined a, a player as skilled and sort of perfect for our needs would would be there for us as Dalton Connect. Um, we had him, you know, as a top 10 player unanimously across our scouting boards. Um, I was at the SEC tournament uh, scouting him extensively. And in my mind was like, there's no way a player like this could be available for us to pick on draft night. And he was nearly right. A lot of the mock drafts that are respected had connect as a top 10 pick, some top six. Now, I've been doing the NBA draft for a long time. I didn't have connect in the lottery because I know the history. He's 23 years old. The history of 23-year-olds in the lottery is littered with failure. A lot of that has to do with, hey, this is a guy who was 22, 23 as a college basketball player playing against teenagers. Of course he's going to slaughter them. And so those guys drafted high usually end up being massive failures. But Connect fell out of the lottery, and oh, by the way, he fell into the lap of LeBron and Anthony Davis. Pretty good place to fall. Now, Redick, if you, if you guys recall, was a guy at Duke who was an absolute sniper, one of the best scorers I've ever seen in college basketball. But his, his you know, prototype was, like, and this guy can't, who can he defend? Jay Mack, he might not be able to defend you in your men's league. Who could Dalton Connect defend? It's a different story, folks. It's a different league right now. You want those switchable wings. Will people pick on Dalton Connect? Maybe, maybe, but you know what? He's got Anthony Davis behind him. I can tell you right now, unequivocally, Dalton Connect will be a key rotation player for the Lakers this season. Unlike the guy they drafted, uh, Hood Shafino, last year, who did absolutely nothing. He was one of those upside plays. So Connect is a big win, which leads me to J.J. Redick and Connect. I think it's going to be a good marriage. I'm almost certain that Connect kind of pushed for him. Uh, or, sorry, Redick pushed for Connect. But something Redick said at his presser was kind of glossed over. And I want to touch on it because I absolutely love this topic. Here's J.J. Redick talking about the media at his press conference. It's been a really interesting uh, six weeks or so, um, just in terms of, uh, you know, being part of the engagement farming uh, industry. You know, it's been really interesting. Um, however, I, I, I don't really have a great answer for your uh, question because I, I really don't give a f like, honestly. I want to coach the Lakers. I want to coach the team. I don't want to dispel anything. I don't. I want to become a great coach in the NBA, and I want to win championships, and I want my players to maximize their careers. That's all I care about. <laughs> I kind of love J.J. Redick now. Engagement farming. What a phrase. Oh, my gosh. Can I borrow that, J.J.? Can I use that? Because it's incredible. And it's actually spot on. You guys, I, listen, once he said that, he was critically panned social media, columnists, all the traditional media. They ripped him. You don't come out slinging F-bombs in your introductory press conference. But Reddick claims to not care. Now, I will remind everybody, within the last year, J.J. Reddick was part of that engagement farming economy uh, that is the sports media. And he's not wrong. You guys know this, okay? This show will usually have something related to the Dallas Cowboys. You could call that engagement farming if you want. The Cowboys built a juggernaut in the mid-90s. Just as the internet was coming along, the Cowboys become America's team. When their games are on uh, in the 4 o'clock window here on Fox, when they're on primetime, the Cowboys get massive ratings. Okay, so is it engagement farming for us to talk about the Cowboys all the time? Or is that giving the people what they want? Now, the other side of the equation is, hey, Jason, do you give your kids what they want for dinner every night? Or do you give them what they need, which is probably a glass of milk and some vegetables? Now, I think it's a happy medium between both. But I, I, I don't disagree with what Reddick said. 
And he's not wrong about the engagement farming economy. It's a fascinating discussion, but here's what he missed.